Very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and please let me welcome you all to a significant gathering uh, this afternoon uh, under the ages of Poda Redu space. We've gathered here today uh, for two purposes. One which is an overarching purpose, that is the launch and the initiation of Poda Redu space in its reimagined version, in its reimagined uh, imagination of what it wants to achieve and what it wants to provide to students, professionals, and industry veterans by creating a global community of bringing these three together in the form of a knowledge ecosystem where they can create, share, and mentor experiences. Uh, and the second purpose is, of course, we have a veteran entrepreneur and ideator and industrialist amongst us, Mr. Rakesh Vahi, to enlighten us with his personal story of how he has gone about in his journey so that we all can learn and then put our questions to him uh, and, and get some inspiration. I would right away take you through the flow of the session in terms of how it would go before I would invite our managing director to introduce the uh, guest, Mr. Vahi. Uh, Mr. Rajiv Podar will introduce all of you to the guest speaker uh, in a couple of minutes before handing it over to the CEO of Podar Edu Space, Mr. Vedant Podar, who will uh, humbly invite Mr. Vahi to symbolically launch this reimagined vision, which is being vehicled through our website. We can't really have him press the physical button, but Vedant has a way of doing that somehow. Uh, and then when this is done for five minutes, we would have 30 to 40 minutes of the speech by Mr. Vahi where we would all love to hear from him about his experience. We would then jump onto uh, the concluding session, concluding remarks by uh, our leadership board member, uh, Mr. Ratul, who will conclude the remarks and encapsulate Mr. Vahi's comments. We would then have the last 15 to 20 minutes being coordinated by Mr. Vedan Podar again, where all of you would be very welcome to ask questions under his moderation. And that's how we would conclude the session. So without any further delay, let me invite uh, Mr. Rajiv Podar, Managing Director, Podar Enterprises, for introducing Mr. Vahi and taking the proceedings forward. Thank you. Thank you, Shetiji. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. A man of highest integrity, a friend of friends, a great human being, a very successful self-made businessman. It's my honor to present and introduce to you Mr. Rakesh Vahi. Mr. Rakesh Vahi is a visionary entrepreneur who has been involved with early stage investments in emerging markets for the last 40 years. He is a well-respected member of the investment community and has distinguished himself in the field of IT, telecom, media, technology, and education investments in the Middle East, North and South Africa, and the Sub-Sahara Africa. Mr. Vahi is the chairman of CMA Investments Holding that represents through its portfolio companies in over 20 countries. Mr. Vahi is the co-founder of ABM Group that includes CNBC Africa, Forbes Africa, and ABN Productions. He is also the co founder of Trans National Academic Group that owns Curtin University Dubai, Lancashire University Ghana, TAG Middle East, and ABN Training Institute. He was also the, he is also the co founder of Tech One Global, which is one of Asia's most awarded IT company that is in technology solutions integrator. Mr. Vahi was awarded with honorary doctorate degree of science from the International University of Management by the Minister of Education in Nambia in October 2012. Mr. Vahi is the founder of ABN Education Trust in South Africa and the TAG Foundation in Ghana to finance education to children from previously disadvantaged family in Africa. In November 2016, Mr. Vahi 
published his memoirs through an autobiography named titled Be a Lion that is published by Penguin South Africa. I can go on and on. And if I'm to read his whole bio, I think one hour will be also too short. So I will not take more of your time. I'm sure all of us are eagerly waiting to hear Mr. Wahi and also for the launch of our website. With this, I'll hand over to Mr. Vedan Udar to take it forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, I would like to take this opportunity to announce the launch of our new website. So essentially, we have officially relaunched ourselves with a new and reimagined vision and with new ideas. Um, please visit us at www.podareduspace.org for interesting programs and initiatives and to be, to be a part of our growing knowledge ecosystem. So may I please request um, Rakesh Vahiji to do the honor of launching this website by clicking the enter button on his laptop and uh, we can then present it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Uncle. And I think, uh, please visit this website, like I said, uh, to be a part of our knowledge ecosystem and uh, discover all the programs and initi initiatives that you've come up with. And now, uh, without further delay, let me pass on uh, and welcome uh, Rakesh Vahiji to talk and inspire us today through his journey and introduce a topic, entrepreneurship and leadership from a soldier who dared to dream. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you so much, Rajiv Podar, uh, uh, for the kind introduction and to Mr. Vedant Podar for inviting me to address this prestigious webinar today. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to firstly uh, congratulate all the participants for firstly taking time to listen to me. Uh, but secondly, and more importantly, on considering to embark on a journey of continuous learning and learning through uh, Podar EduSpace. I personally believe that our life is a journey of learning and improving ourselves. And this can only be achieved by dreaming of the place you want to be, perhaps 20 years from today, and then choosing the path and the tools that you need to get there. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is my entrepreneurial journey and give you some top line lessons that I hope will be useful. After my talk, as Vedant has mentioned, I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Now, a common theme that we all experience in life, to my mind, is a derivative of five factors. These five factors are unique to everyone's journey. And therefore, remember, that in life, there is no one size that fits all. These five factors are our individual circumstances, the choices that we make during our lives, the people who come into our lives and influence our lives, and how in turn we influence the lives of others. Fourthly, the opportunities that come to us through the people that we interact with. And finally, which is now becoming a very important aspect is change. How do we deal with change? How do we transform ourselves or our businesses that we are in? So when you listen to me today, I request you to bear in mind that I'm a product of my own circumstances and my journey is extremely unique to me. This can therefore only be an illustration but should not be a limitation for you to be the best of yourself. So I want to start with a bit of a history and want to take you back to the 50s and 60s, uh, showing you how old I am and, you know, the dinosaur that, uh, uh, you know, the generation that I am with. Now, during the time we were growing up, everyone wanted to be a lawyer, an accountant, an engineer, or a doctor. Now, keep in mind, this was a time in India when we had phones that had dialers. We only played outdoor games. For entertainment, we watched Krishi Darshan or Doodarshan uh, on black and white television. And when we communicated, it was writing letters to each other. And sometimes it would take a month 
to get a response back from friends and family. We used typewriters and carbon paper to make copies and there were no calculators. Now this was the world we started in. It was a linear and a very analog world. On the family side, my father was a soldier and an engineer. And that's what my career ambition was as happened in our generation and in most generations. I'm a graduate of the National Defense Academy and the Indian Military Academy. I was commissioned into the Corps of Engineers in 1980. And my first assignment in the army was to build the test sites for India's second nuclear test in Pokhran. Uh, you may, some of you may have seen a movie called Parmanu that was made on this project. And during this assignment, I became a casualty and almost died. When I was in the hospital recovering and fighting death, that's the time I came to the realization that life can end with the touch of a button. And this precious gift must be celebrated each day to achieve what you truly desire. Now for my role in Pokhran II, at the age of 26, I was among the youngest officers in the history of the Indian Army to be given the Vishesh Seva Medal in 1985 by the President of India. And for those of you who do not have a military background, the VSM is the military equivalent of the Padma Shri. I then completed my civil engineering at the College of Military Engineering and subsequently served with the 1st Armored Division in 1986 and 87 in Patiala, where I had the privilege of commanding a T-55 tank troop. I was then sent to build India's second base at the Antarctic in 1987, which was one of the greatest experiences in my life. Now, while the seeds of change were born when I was in hospital during Pokhran II, it was when I was at the Antarctic that I decided to leave the armed forces, a decision that was not supported by my family. Now, you can imagine that as a decorated soldier, my father believed that my future was to be a general. And incidentally, uh, in the last uh, appointments of uh, the heads of chiefs, all three service chiefs were uh, from my batch, the Army, Navy, and Air Force. But going back to my family, they all believed at that time, and they joked in the family that my brains had frozen in the Antarctic cold. My decision was not because there was something wrong with serving in the military, but quite on the contrary. It's one of the finest careers that anyone can have, and I can proudly say that I would not be the man I am today if it was not for the training in the army. The army had kept all its commitments to me, but my needs had changed. And I made a choice to move on, to try something completely different. But I had absolutely no idea of the world that I was stepping into. In September, September 1988, I had 17,000 rupees in my bank, a young wife and a five month old son. I then stepped into a world that I was neither prepared nor trained for. And talking about my training, it was in demolitions, anti-tank warfare, bridging, bomb disposal, specializing in booby traps, minefields, in general, everything that is destructive. And these are not things that you can write on a CV for corporate employment. <laughs> so the only thing that I carried with me was discipline and a very strong value system that the army had ingrained in me. I moved to Dubai in 1989 with, my, with the help of my sister who was based here. And it was perhaps the best opportunity that I had at that time and the best decision that I made. Now, for those of you who traveled to Dubai, you would know that this is a very welcoming investor friendly destination, which is right at the center of the globe. Around the time that I moved in 1989, 90, and then 91, the CIS markets were opening up and I traveled with the help of a few old school friends and made my first money through trading in uh, the CIS. It was a world with no cell phones, emails, or the internet. Uh, telex machines at that time were our saviors until the analog fax machines came along and at that time, the fax machines revolutionized our world. Uh, this is, you know, the kind of circumstances that we come from. 
the CIS at that time in 1991, you know, a lot of it is in the news right now, but was at best at that time descri uh, described as a cowboy country. Russia was a paradise for anyone who was prepared to take risks and could understand the cultural nuances of the region. Indians at that time were their only trusted trading partner. There was money to be made in everything that you touched, whether it was real estate, commodities, and with some exceptions, everything that I tried to do was reasonably profitable. The opportunities were endless. And you could say that, you know, it was being at the right place at the right time. But there are a lot of people who actually end up in life at the right place at the right time, but they do not have the ability to act. And we were able to take bold decisions, take calculated risks. And for all, as long as I was operating below the radar in the CIS, nobody saw us as a threat. But by 1994, the whole world had an interest in Russia and competition in small businesses, the areas that we were in, became very fierce. Now, hundreds of people were doing what I was doing, and there was very little point of differentiation. We tried to invest into the banking sector, participate in the privatization of a few state enterprises, but failed in everything that I'm talking about now, because legislation was weak, opaque, and there was a huge fight for turf in the core sectors. You know, a lot of uh, words are used around this fight, uh, including and not limited to words like mafia. I realized that I lacked two main ingredients that are critical to establish a sustainable business. The first was resources, and the second was personal credibility. Now, it dawned on me that to build a sustainable business, I needed to build an organization. And rec recognizing these shortcomings, I made a choice once again and withdrew from Russia as I was not adequately prepared to continue in that market. Now, around this time, I met a very visionary American entrepreneur who introduced me to investment banking, asset management, and the world of information technology, media, and telecommunications. Uh, we know it as TMT or the ICT sectors. Now, these were unfamiliar areas, but I spent the next eight years of my life from 1994 to 2002 in navigating a path that I knew nothing about. I'm a great believer that people play a very important role in your life and they come into your life for a reason. You build interdependence and make them entwined into your destiny. And you'll all see that there is no relationship in life that can flourish without mutual interdependence. We rely on each other for our strengths and our complementary skills. This is the basis of any team, whether on the sports field, battlefield, or in business. Now to prepare for this phase, I went back to educating myself. And since I did not have the luxury of going to for a full-time university program, I began to get up at 4 a.m. every day to study finance and read about the ICT sectors. I attended workshops and conferences and took every opportunity to learn. You've got to remember that you cannot lead from ignorance. And if I had to lead people coming out of Harvard and Stanford, I needed to know what they knew and more. And this simply reiterates my earlier message for all my young friends in the webinar today, that you constantly need to educate yourself, keep yourself current with technology and with the latest trends in your respective fields, or you run the risk of becoming completely irrelevant. I started my journey into the world of investment banking in the TMT sectors. We set up a development company in Dubai to set up media and telecom projects in the Middle East and North Africa. As an example, we were amongst the first to be awarded a license to operate a prepaid calling card business in Saudi Arabia. We looked at investments in Egypt, in Morocco, uh, Yemen, Jordan, Lebanon, uh, the GCC countries, and a lot of other emerging markets. We also set up an investment banking business in Bombay. And among many other things, we in, were early stage investors into TV18, or you would better know it as CNBC India. Now the crowning glory, glory for me at this, uh, in this phase of my uh, career was that I was part of a leadership team 
that set up the Middle East's first Islamic private equity fund focused on technology. Now, this period for me was magical and perhaps the most important and greatest learning curve in shaping my life. As I began to understand the two most critical factors that impact business. Firstly, and as we started seeing it already at the turn of the century, was the power of technology. And the second, and the most important part of any business is the flow of capital. Now, as luck would have it, around the year 2000, I'm sure a lot of you would remember or would have read about it, the dot-com bubble burst. Now, internet companies that had mushroomed and gained incredible value, they all started to crash. Luckily for us, uh, we had kept clear uh, by strategy or by design of any investments in internet companies. However, with the collapse of dot-com companies, the financial markets crashed. And in 2002, I was faced with yet another crisis where everything that I had learned and built over the last eight years was again under threat. I once again went back to the drawing board and I had to make a choice. Either continue with the asset management business or try something completely different. Only difference this time around was that I was better prepared. I had not only built a better balance sheet for myself, but had significant emerging markets experience. I had built a lot of personal credibility and had specialized in ICT, which was then the most rapidly growing sector in the world. Now, based on my experiences and the opportunities that came about, I took a decision to start building businesses bottom up, but in emerging markets. And the main reason was that I believe that the maximum value and wealth creation takes place when you start a business from scratch. Based on experience between 94 and 2002, I decided to take well-established global brands to emerging markets. So while I was prepared to take all other risks, including financial and political risks, I did not want to take a brand risk. So in 2002, we approached Microsoft to represent them in Sri Lanka. At that time, there was a war going on in Sri Lanka and Microsoft was very cautious about making a commitment. But I knew that the war would end. And with a population of 28 million unserved customers in Sri Lanka with a 99% piracy in those days, I thought that the investment decision was a no brainer. And we met instant success. Over a period of 20 years, the last two decades, we expanded that operation now to Bangladesh, Nepal, Maldives, Brunei, Philippines, and Singapore. From a three people business that we set up in 2002, it's a 700 people organization in seven countries today. Similarly, for media in 2005, we approached uh, CNBC for their franchise in sub sahara Africa. I had watched the success of CNBC India and decided that this was the media genre that we could easily replicate in Africa. We established CNBC Africa in 2007 with its headquarters in South Africa and bureaus across the African continent, which included countries like uh, Kenya, Rwanda, a lot of the SADC countries and uh, uh, Nigeria and, uh, in West Africa. In 2011, we launched our public, uh, publishing business with Forbes Africa. Now, most of you would remember after the financial crisis in 2008, everybody advised against launching a magazine and the whole world was turning digital. I knew in my gut that launching a magazine with a brand like Forbes would do well. And despite all the advice, I went ahead. We did have a digital strategy with the uh, conventional magazine, but we still went ahead with it. And we are today Africa's most influential and perhaps the only Pan-African business media organization. We are also CNBC International's largest network partner in the world, covering and serving about 54 countries. The third sector that we are invested into is in, edu is in education. And this was largely because of the skills shortages that I saw in emerging markets. So we took a decision to get into higher education. 
And in 2007, we partnered with Murdoch University from Australia to set up a campus here in Dubai. In 2013, we partnered with Lancaster University out of the UK uh, to set up a campus in Ghana. And finally, in uh, 2017, we brought Curtin University, which is highly specialized in engineering and STEMs uh, back uh, from Perth to Dubai. Our aim today is to set up uh, centers of excellence, largely in STEM disciplines, by partnering globally ranked universities, but mainly investing into Africa. Now, as a group, we today have a presence, as uh, Mr. Koda had mentioned, in 20 countries where we employ a little over 1,000 people and uh, have a staff from over 40 countries. So what has gone into building a multinational and a multicultural organization? I'll highlight this answer through a few lessons that I'd like to pass on from my experience. And these have a bearing on both leadership and entrepreneurship. And the first lesson that I'd like to pass on is learning to dream. You must dream and dream big. Remember that if you lack imagination, you lack creativity. And lacking creativity is a default setting for mediocrity. The world is your oyster. And if you do not reach for the stars, particularly at the age that you are, you will never get to the clouds. But you have to remember that dreaming is not enough. You have to work hard to actualize it. So once you visualized, conceptualized, then everything rests on implementation. Now, irrespective of the field, people without a purpose or a vision will never be truly successful. At best, you will meander. In this context, also learn to back yourself and follow your gut. Now, over the years, if there's one thing I've developed very well, is a very strong instinct. Now, this is not very scientific, but your inner instinct is a manifestation of your values. And whatever you initially have an instinct around will generally always be right. Secondly, becoming an, become an entrepreneur for the right reasons. This path is full of sacrifice and is a lifelong commitment. I've heard a lot of young people say that they want freedom because they want to work for, for themselves because they want to be free. The truth cannot be further away. Being an entrepreneur comes with the greatest responsibility as you not only have to look after your business, but more importantly, you have to pay the bills at the end of every month, which is a big responsibility. It's a 24 seven commitment to your work. And it's like bringing up a child. It's not a part-time vocation. You can't say I'm a parent from nine to five and from five to nine overnight, somebody else is going to take care of your child. You have to be there all the time. And for those of you who are interested in poker and follow the game, there's a term that you use to be an entrepreneur. You have to be all in. The third lesson that I want to share with you is thinking long-term. Everything that you do in life, think about the long-term and look at building businesses in perpetuity. And a very important aspect of this long-term thinking is finding the right purpose. Answer the question, why? Do not look for short-term returns. Those days are over. A part of this is that, remember, money is a byproduct of success. It's not a goal for an entrepreneur. If money is a goal, you're not in the business of being an entrepreneur. So an important aspect is being very patient. You'll have a lot of highs and lows. But if you believe in what you're doing, and if the fundamentals are strong, Give yourself a runway to succeed. I'll give you an example of long-term and what it means to set up legacies. I was in Prague in December 2015, completing the legacy chapter of my book. It was an opportune time for me to visit the university, uh, Charles University, which was established seven centuries ago. After 700 years, Charles IV is not remembered for anything other than this grand university 
that is graduating thousands of students in various disciplines and who carry a certificate bearing his name. It made me reflect on what a legacy truly is. People will seldom remember you for the wealth that you accumulate. They will remember you for your deeds and they'll remember you for the impact that you made on the lives of others. On that note, an important aspect of ethical and responsible leadership is a strong focus on corporate social responsibility. As a family, we established various foundations to give back. With my wife sitting as, it, as its patron, we decided to focus our attention on three areas, often children, destitute women, and tertiary education for children from disadvantaged families. Many beneficiaries of these schemes are also families of our own staff. I always believe that charity begins at home. Even through the worst of COVID, we did not shy away from supporting these causes, even when our businesses were making losses. This activity therefore must come from your heart. Be sensitive to your environment, your social responsibilities and towards good governance. These are the hallmarks of long-term sustainability. The fourth lesson that I want to talk about is failure. Failure is a path to success. You will unfortunately face, fail face failure many times during your journey. We all have. Don't get discouraged when you fail. Don't give up. Learn from your mistakes and get back on your feet. But you must remember that you do not repeat mistakes. Also remember that the greatest lessons in life come from failure and not from success. Success can make you complacent. Failure helps you sharpen yourself and keeps you rooted. Now in this context, the one thing that you must throw out of the window if you want to be a successful leader or entrepreneur is your ego. Never feel you are above anything or any work is beneath you or that you're above any other human being. If you bring humility into your life, you'll be able to navigate this journey in a collaborative manner. I've spoken a lot about people and an important aspect of your life as an entrepreneur or a good leader is to surround yourself with good people. You cannot do everything by yourself and you have to build complementary skills. Look after your people and make sure that they have bought into your vision for the future. Be fair to them, but be firm. Keep talking to them and build mutual interdependence, a word that I use all the time. And since people are our largest assets, I stay involved with the HR department and all my businesses and make sure that there is a clear management of expectations between the organization and its people. Now, there are some basic qualities that I have looked for in people over the years. Internally, in all my businesses, we've coined a term called LIAC, which stands for loyalty, integrity, attitude, competence, and commitment. In my view, if people don't have high marks in these five qualities, they're unlikely to make it into my senior team. You all have heard of Warren Buffett. He famously said that in hiring people, look for three qualities, integrity, intelligence, and energy. If they don't have integrity, don't bother with the rest. Other than integrity, an important quality in my dictionary is attitude. A good leader is not only someone who has a positive attitude at all times, but is able to surround himself with positive people who can find solutions and are not part of a problem. I'm going to talk about a very unscientific factor which is that of luck. Very few people consider the role of Lady Luck. And you'll see from your experience, from your childhood, that there are a lot of colleagues that get away with the biggest indiscretions. While there are some that get caught even when they whisper for the first time in class. Similarly, the timing of events in business are important. And there are so many people who always get caught on the wrong side of expansions, market turbulences, or currency fluctuations. 
There's no science to this. Because somebody who invests or takes decisions one hour before you could be in a completely different boat than you are. But what you've got to remember is that where luck is concerned, you have to have faith. And you also got to understand whether you're lucky or not. And if you haven't won at bingo, take it that you belong to a class of people that needs to work twice as hard or surround yourself with people who have a Midas touch. And definitely ensure that you marry someone with better luck than yourself. Now seventh, you must remember that the journey of an entrepreneur is of building credibility, something that I had talked about right at the beginning. And this is about ethics and integrity. It's your name that people will trust. Life has a lot of ups and downs and your shareholders, bankers and other stakeholders don't expect that things will always be on a high. But they need to trust the fact that whatever be the circumstances, you will do whatever is in the best interest of your business and not in your personal interest. Set high standards for yourself and lead by example. You must become a gold standard. And you, when you say something, people must know that your word is your honor. When you give it, you will keep it. At the end of your life, this is the only currency that you would have truly earned, is your personal credibility. I'd like to turn to another very important aspect that is impacting our lives today. This is technology, innovation, disruption, and the need to change. There is not a single industry today that has not been disrupted. The pandemic has only catalyzed what was already coming. We live in a world of technological singularity. This process is now irreversible. All businesses have to transform so that you don't become somebody else's lunch. Now, an important characteristic during this phase is that of the new generation to which all of you belong. Now, whether it is the millennials or the generation Z or whatever terminology you use for yourself. But what I find is that this generation has refused to accept the status quo. They ask the question why, even before they have heard the question fully. Now, while this is a very difficult time for my generation, because we couldn't ask these questions of our parents, the reality is that these questions provide life-changing solutions for the future. Now, as business owners, entrepreneurs, an important priority is to relook at our business models and operations to determine whether we are not only relevant to our customers and our product offering, but also that we are competitive. I'd like to give you two examples from our media and our IT business. In our media business in 2007, we had about 40,000 square feet of space. Uh, this is at our headquarters in Johannesburg. Now, my son joined the business in 2010 after uh, finishing his uh, undergraduate in uh, Canada. And, you know, a few months after he joined the business, he walked into my office one day and, uh, you know, children always catch you off guard. And he says, Dad, you're running an inefficient business. So that's the time when you look up and uh, pay attention to what your children have to say to you. And his view was that our equipment was obsolete. Our processes were linear and our resource requirements were much higher than what was required to support our business model. I looked at him in amazement as we had just invested millions of dollars just three years before he joined. But then you don't want to discourage your children. So I asked him to come back to the restructuring plan. I looked at me and he says, Dad, I'll do all of this if you don't file away what I'm going to recommend and you actually implement it. Otherwise, I don't want to waste my time. I'm happy to go to the clubs. So I told him, look, bring something back that I can take a look at. And six months later, I put him before the board to explain his findings and his plan. Now, he made an excellent presentation to the board. But before he finished, he gave us the example of Kodak. Now, some of you may or may not remember this company but it was amongst the top brands in handheld cameras. 
But the company failed to see the threat from cell phone cameras. They did not change because of their complacency. The same thing happened with companies like BlackBerry. Today, these companies are dead. And my son ended this presentation by quoting the famous words, bankruptcy is a Kodak moment. Now, after this presentation, I requested the board to look at it objectively and we approved the plans to be executed immediately. Now, the outcome of this was that we reduced our space by 75% to 10,000 square feet from 40,000. We reduced our staff from by 65%. And we spent a little bit on uh, CapEx to digitize our studios and install robot robotic cameras. But this made us a lean, relevant, and competitive business. But more than anything else, this was a very important lesson for me to involve the younger generation in our decision-making. As they may not have gray hair, but they understand technology and they understand the future consumers. And these insights are valuable. So I started a reverse mentorship program in the company where I have all the young people sitting with me once every quarter, telling me what I'm doing wrong. And my only job is to sit down and listen to this mentorship. We are very used to telling people what to do. I think the time is right for us to sit and actually listen to the next generation and hear out what they believe we are doing wrong in our businesses and then take corrective action. Now, the other example I want to give you is that in our IT business, we are in the software distribution business. And for some of you uh, who are on this webinar from the generation I belong to, you'll rem remember that when we used to start a new PC, there used to be a big box that used to come with floppy disks to load uh, you know, Word or whatever else we wanted to use. This then moved on to a CD, and then it's now being done off the cloud using an encryption key. So the value of the product from Microsoft has not changed, but the methodology and the process has completely changed. So in our distribution business, we evolved from being a licensed distributor to becoming a systems integrator. From just providing licenses, we started managing desktops remotely for large organizations. For instance, we manage about 20,000 desktops in Brunei. And our today a technology solutions integrator, but it did not stop there. We acquired a document management company in Sri Lanka. We set up a software development center to create our own IP with about 150 engineers. We started offering value added services and moved away from earning small margins in the software distribution business to services with higher margins around the same software that we were distributing. So we didn't change the core. We changed the way we were operating. We are today one of the most awarded IT solutions company in Asia. So what this essentially means is that you have to keep evolving and upskilling your businesses and your people to remain relevant. Change is therefore an inevitable path to growth. Don't get into a comfort zone of accepting the status quo. I believe that innovation by definition is to redefine how to do things better and more efficiently. This is causing disruption, but it's bringing about efficiencies. And COVID has seen so much, you know, we've got so used to getting everything delivered at home. I was at Expo, we've seen what's going to happen into the future. In practical terms, a lot of opportunities are now being created with a new ecosystem. And this will continue to grow. Our businesses that do not change in time will perish. There is no question about it. And this is not because the products are not needed. It's because somebody else is going to be offering the same product in a more cost-effective and efficient manner. I've left a very important lesson right to the end. This is about making choices. You would have observed that throughout my life, I've made choices that were unique to my life. I joined the army, left the army, went into trading, made a success but left went into investment banking, corporate finance, asset management, made a success, but moved on to become an entrepreneur. And I now believe that this was my destiny. So life is a series of choices that we make, and these combine to slowly but surely map our future. We often find ourselves at a crossroad, and we all do. 
it doesn't matter what age you are, you'll always be sitting at a crossroad to make decisions and what line or what track to follow. And these decisions will sometimes be difficult. But what I can only advise you is that every decision that you make in life should be made with your conscience. If the act is wrong or crosses ethical boundaries, do not take that path, irrespective of the rewards. Therefore, spend your time thinking about the consequences of your choices. Choose sensibly, choose ethically. And once you've made your choice, then give it your best. I'll give you an anecdote before I finish my talk. I was speak speaking at a convergence conference many years ago when I was asked about where I saw the future. You know, everybody thinks that you reach a point in life where you have a crystal ball. Seldom, we have absolutely no idea what's happening the next day. But you know, I had to reflect on this question. And then I thought of my grandmother who was born in 1916 and she died in 2010. Now she was based in Dehradun and she saw everything from bullock carts, horse carriages, cars, locomotives, electricity, aircrafts, the space age, television, nuclear energy, mobile phones, and finally the internet at the turn of the century. Now let's fast forward to your generation. The internet, the world of cryptocurrencies, I was talking about this with Vedant yesterday, blockchain and Web3. This, my young friends, is the bullock cart of your generation. This is the bullock cart. This is not the end. This is the start point. You, are, you have all grown up with this. I believe that everything that you can conceptualize today will eventually become a reality. You cannot be at a better place than when, where you are today in human history. At the expo, I've seen conversations around unmanned vehicles, biometrics, 5G, frequencies with no commercial use today. And this is all part of your future. And as I said before, that as the proverbial dinosaur, I cannot even imagine today the opportunities that are coming before you. And quite frankly, our generation cannot answer that question because we cannot look into a crystal ball of the future because things are changing so rapidly that without imagination and without the ability to look into the future, you will always remain static. So learn to dream big and aim for the stars and you will all achieve greatness in your lives. With these words, I wish you all the very, very best and look forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much, uh, Aiji. I'll just pass on to Atulji to uh, talk next. Thank you, Vedant. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vahi, for your superb speech. You have not just narrated your life events, but also left so many learnings for us. All of us are here to learn. And you have given us the three fundamental pillars of life. The first one is the discipline. The second one is the value system. And the third one is constant learning, constant education. And all of this needs the reflection on what is happening, what has happened, and what could possibly happen. You have given us the mantra of learning, reflecting, improvising, and practice. Keep on learning, keep on learning, and keep on improvising. Dreaming big is something that you have left us with as a thought, and I'm sure the generation today has just big, as you said, and there is a lot more to come their way. The function which you rightly said is the integrity, that integrity is something which the world needs. The fundamentals cannot be ignored. To be a lion is what you say, and I think today we met the lion. Thank you so much for all your kind words and things. Over to you, Edant. Thank you so much, uh, Atulji. I think before we move on to the Q&A and uh, vote of thanks, I'll just ask our consulting strategy head who wanted to talk about today for a couple of minutes, uh, Professor Bansal. And then uh, we'll just open the floor to Q&A. 
um, in the meantime, if anyone does have any questions, please feel to write on chat or directly to me. Uh, and I'll be happy to uh, unmute uh, you so you can ask uh, YAG later. Thank you. Uh, Professor, you're on mute. Uh, Thank you, Vedan. I just wanted to come in because, uh, Mr. Vahi, I had kept one special thing reserved, which earlier was a plan that we would announce at the beginning. But right in the last five seconds, when I began to introduce the session, I thought, let's have his story first. And I think 70 odd people who are listening to us right now will be able to put things in a better perspective after they've heard you. And, and I was absolutely correct. Uh, I have the pleasure to inform you, Mr. Wahi, and the entire audience that today we've launched a flagship project that we call Podar Conversations. And I think there could not have been a better fitting inaugural edition of Podar Conversations than this. Podar Conversations is our first flagship project of Podar Edospace after we've done a very successful four batch running of Howard Podar Fitch WorkEx Bootcamp. And I tell you why in 30 seconds, the reimagined vision that we are talking about through the vehicle of our website is the vision of creating a community, a knowledge community. It is not a vision of creating certain products, certain programs. It is a vision of bringing people together like we have today. These 70 odd people are students from universities, early and mid-career professionals, young entrepreneurs like Vedant, like Avinash, like Ramya, industry veterans with decades of experience like you yourself, Mr. Vahi, Mr. Podar, Mr. Ratul, and academics like me, who are in the middle of upskilling, innovating, learning and practicing, where they teach law at a premier law school, dealing with climate change policy, but they've joined the family of a startup journey as a consulting strategy head. I think all of us fit into the storyline that you've so beautifully exhibited and explained. So thank you so much. And I would inform the audience for one more thing. We are posting just now a Google web link in the chat box and would urge you, each one of you to click on that link and give us just a bit of your details, name, phone number and email for the very purpose of inviting you to the community that we are creating. We'll keep you posted about the programs that are coming up and more Podar Conversations editions. It's a monthly flagship mentoring series, as we are calling it. We are not having academic sessions. We want these industry veterans to come in and share their personal journeys so that we can learn from the empirics of what they've done. We learn from books in our universities and in the magazines and journals already. So thank you so much, Mr. Vahi, uh, uh, for, for so befitting uh, as an inaugural edition in this flagship series that we've launched. Over to you, Vedant, for the uh, concluding part of the session. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Saman sir. So we have a few questions uh, in the chat. Sorry, we'll be taking up your time, uh, Ayuji. Um, Ashna has asked this uh, question directly to me, which is, uh, you have many, uh, you have faced many setbacks uh, during your journey. What motivated you every time to move on with more vapor? I guess at what stage of your life you made meet uh, challenges. And, uh, you know, when you're starting out in life, the only motivation is putting, putting food on your table. Uh, that is the biggest motivation for all of us, uh, that you protect your family and look at basic requirements, your physiological requirements. So, you know, I don't want to talk about grandiose things in life. I think the basics for everybody is to make a decent living for your family. Over a longer period, you have different kinds of challenges where you know you have issues around regulatory approvals, where you have to deal with typical emerging market problems, where you have to then stay with your value system. And I'll give you an answer, uh, example of something we dealt with in a country like Nigeria, where after 10 years, I was called in by the Minister of Education one, uh, Information one day 
who turned around and said, uh, you know, how are you operating in our country? And I said, Minister, this is a question you should have asked me when I applied for a license 10 years ago. And he says, well, uh, you know, uh, my people tell me that you owe us X. And I knew where this was going. So I told him, I said, Minister, let me tell you one thing very clearly. I don't have to go back to a board. I don't have to go back to anybody. But if you are asking me to pay one cent, I will shut my operations and take my bags to Ghana and start operating from there. So I think, you know, it goes back to your own beliefs in life and what value systems you want to set up. And that's what keeps you going forward. So a lot of problems will keep coming. You've got to look through the problem, identify what is the right path forward, and then progress down that path. Every situation is going to be different, so I cannot give you a cookie cutter kind of an answer, but you've got to look at the situation and then do things which are aligned with your conscience. And that's what will motivate you to continue going. It's that self-belief in what you're doing. Wow, I think that uh, very well answers the question and it serves as a great uh, motivation for all of us as well to keep in mind when uh, we go through failures uh, in our entrepreneurship journey. Uh, we have a very interesting question. So having been part of mentoring and reverse mentoring for close to 30 years, um, do you feel the gaps between uh, the gap between the generations widening, both, you know, in terms of thought processes and the approach to problem solving? And how do you bridge this gap? Uh, this is from Shivani uh, from the chat. Yeah. Look, there's, this bridging of gap is going to be a conversation. Uh, it's not something new. It happened when we were growing up. We thought that we were a very different generation from our parents. I remember one day at the age of 40, I was sitting with my father and he said something to me. And I said, Dad, I'm 40 and I got children. And he looked at me and he said, you're still my son. <laughs> and I think, you know, there is going to be this factor in an environment like ours. We are basically a very socially knitted uh, ecosystem in India. So from an emotional factor or a social factor, this will always be a very uh, closely knitted conversation. But when you look at what is happening with the changes that are taking place and the evolution, as I told you at the end of my talk, that you know your kids are sitting with something called Web3. People in my generation don't understand it. You know, my son is dealing with NFTs. I don't understand it. Now, when he talks to me, the only thing I tell him is that be careful, do it within the law. You can't bridge anything here. I can neither understand the language that the young people are talking about today, neither can I understand where things are going. I still don't order food to my uh, house. I don't know how to uh, use the things that you guys use on your cell phones. I hate using Ubers. I had called my secretary to call a car for me. You know, we are, there's a generational difference and I now empathize with my father who at 84, uh, you know, or 87 when he passed, I used to wonder, you know, why he's asking me those questions because I'm dealing with the same things now. So this gender divide will remain. Never think that this is going to change because you may think that you're dealing with very, very fancy technology as youngsters today. Your children are going to embarrass the hell out of you. So don't think that you're going to be spared by the next generation. They will ask you, you know, kids, I have got three grandkids now and they already start pressing buttons on, uh, on cell phones. I didn't know what a cell phone was for a large part of my life. Amazing, amazing. Um, I mean, you're absolutely right. I think uh, we'll all face this challenge as we go through, but uh, the beauty of business is that you work with people young and old, and then you get to combine the experiences to come up with something wonderful. Um, I think Sakshi has a question uh, in chat. I'm going to ask her to unmute and if she can ask directly since she's comfortable. Um, Sakshi? Yeah. Am I audible? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so my question to you was that you've had so many varied experiences in different fields. So what was the driving force for you to make this shift and start again in another field with the same level of zeal, enthusiasm, and, you know, make it big there as well? 
No, I, you know, I guess I responded to this in the first uh, uh, question, but uh, you know, when one door closes, another opens. I'm a great believer that you have to continue looking ahead. Uh, when I went to Russia, things got difficult. I stepped out, uh, went into investment banking and asset management. You know, it was market driven in 2000 and the markets collapsed. There was no point raising more money and going back into uh, investing into private equity. I just felt that that wasn't what I enjoyed. I made money there, but money was not the bottom line of what I was looking for. So you've got to really look at what makes you happy. And that's the answer to all your questions. You've got to really ask yourself, is the passion that you have? You know, there's so many people who will be sitting on this call today who are involved in things that you don't truly enjoy doing. You go to a nine to five or you're involved in doing something which is not your calling. And that's what you've got to really ask yourself and find in life. And that's what will continue to torment you till you find it. You know, I saw in, I think, 1992, I was in uh, Sofia in Bulgaria. And I saw this guy playing a violin uh, at dinner. And that smile that he had on his face stays in front of my eyes till today. That was the smile of a man who was content. He was not a rich man. But... He actually enjoyed doing what he was doing. So I think, you know, you will have setbacks, you will have opportunities. And uh, the point that I want to explain to you, Sakshi, something I talked about, is that people are the ones that are going to make all the changes in your life. You will come across people over your lifetime. And when you meet somebody who you feel you have some kind of interdependence with, never let go of those people. These relationships are the ones at the end of your life that you will be able to count on the palm, on the tips of your 10 fingers. What are the 10 relationships you've built? And everything will come out of those 10. You cannot count more than that. And I'm proud to say that one of those fingers is sitting on the call today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from Tanvi. So she said, uh, Mr. Vahi spoke about failure and how failures lead to success. I would love to know if he had any tips or advice on how we as millennials or Gen Z can use the learnings from our failures to succeed. Let me tell you, you know, uh, you're all reading in the news about Ukraine today. Now in 2004, whatever little money I had and we had made in Russia, we were given an opportunity in, to invest into a real estate uh, seaside property in Odessa and because legislation was opaque we lost it because we had to do this in somebody else's name it, we couldn't do it in our own name now these were all lessons for us and the partners were seriously influential people there was the chief of police the mayor of the city and they told my lawyer, a gentleman called Rowan Popov, he called me when I was in Donetsk. That's the city which is under bombing right now. I spent a lot of time in Ukraine. And he called him and told him, tell Mr. Wahi that it's no longer safe for him to come here. Now, that's a failure. It's a failure at different levels. But when somebody is threatening your life itself, you know that it's a serious problem. And so what do you do at a time like that? Do you stupidly go back to that place and fight with them? No, you say, fine, cut your losses. So you've got to know when to walk away. In life, this is a decision that we seldom take at the right time, is when do you cut your losses when you are down? When do you walk away from a situation? And that's the determining factor that turns you around. Because if you keep, you know, it's like when you're trying to put a nail in your wall to hang a painting and the nail keeps bending and you keep putting it in the same hole, you all face that. You've got to find another place to uh, put that nail. You can't going into, keep going at the same place in the same wall. So, so it just means that that painting has to go somewhere else. It's not destined for that place. So cutting your losses is the answer to this, is when you are down, cut your losses and move on to something else. And that's what you've got to understand, is that when something is not working, have faith in yourself. The most important aspect, which I also spoke about during my talk was believe in yourself. That self-belief is what drives you all your life. Never get pulled down by negative people, by negative opinions. You must have faith in what you're doing. And then you'll find your path. You'll navigate. 
you'll navigate your path as all human beings do. There's not a single human being out of the 7 billion people in the world. Everyone will find his path through life. So never hesitate to make change. And you know, we always scared, should I give up my job? 90% of the people are scared to give up their jobs to try something else because you feel what happens if I don't have a salary. I had 17,000 rupees in my bank account. When I came to Dubai, my wife and I used to sit on the floor and eat. We used to have a, we had a cotton, we had a cardboard cotton on which we ate our food for the first two years of our life. That's all I could afford. But I didn't change my path. I continued to go down that route. So don't worry. And that's why I say, don't make money the goal of it. You should be happy with what you're doing. And that happiness quotient of your life is very important because it makes you a positive person. And that's what you need to aspire to become, is positive. Thank you so much. I think uh, that was a brilliant answer for us also to learn from in general, because uh, we, you know, when um, as face this problem in terms of youth as well, we tend to think a lot about, you know, returns and short run, and we don't give our happiness quotient as well as uh, that much importance as you stated. And I'm sure, uh, you know, through your lessons and through your inspiring anecdotes as well, there will be people who are on this, this conversation right now will be able to implement what you've said and you know probably go out there and rethink a few of their strategies as well as you know may make decisions which may uh, lead to them changing their path for the better so thank you so much for sharing uh, so much uh, uncle uh, one one more question um, in the chat from uh, from ashna so um, how do you bridge the gap in education with the growing movement towards sustainability how can you advocate and rally a traditional business behind this and motivate them to take the unconventional route? Uh, is it specific to education or is it? Uh... Uh, I think it will be general to sustainability and, you know, probably uh, teaching traditional businesses to adapt to the new concept. Just come so, you know, let me give you an example of... Uh... And let me, uh, you know, give it anecdotally from what we've experienced right now, let's say in the education business, you know, when COVID started, we got catalyzed into online learning and you can take this for all business and logistics, you know, uh, restaurants went into home delivery, you know, you look at every part of your life changed. Now, we take our lessons and draw lessons from there because everybody thought that edutech meant online learning. What we've learned now over the years is that online is not the answer. There is fatigue. There's a lot of other things that go into this transformation that we're talking about, which are the softer issues that you go through when you are actually experiencing it. So for each of these, you will have to adapt. Now, when we were setting up Curtain over here, we had already started about collaborative learning and uh, distributed learning. Collaborative is when you have beehive desks in your classrooms which are inward facing. So it's not the traditional classrooms, which are lecture style, uh, lecture uh, theater kind of uh, uh, formats, but these are beehives that actually have one television screen in the middle with everyone around it and talk to each other. Collaborative, this is collaborative. On distributed, you have one teacher teaching in six different locations. Now, these were things that we were already talking about before COVID came. Now, a part of this got implemented during COVID, but we also realized that you cannot continue on a singularity path on, uh, on each of these models because the consumers are reacting differently to it and each market is different. You know, there's data restrictions, there's bandwidth problems, there's costs involved. There were so many aspects that came. You look at it for an average family in Africa or in India, they don't have that extra space to work in. You know, if somebody is staying in a one room house, where does the guy actually work from home? You know, you always have the kids, there's noise, there's, you know, there's so many nuances of this transformation that we are dealing with. How do corporates align towards it? You know, we are dealing with this work from home today. There is no answer to how you're going to manage your workforce because every business has a very different requirement for KPIs. Uh, you know, there's some businesses where you can measure performance. There's so many businesses where you can't measure performance. So how do you look at the qualitative side, side of uh, KPIs? So there's a lot of work that has to be done on this, which is what, you know, organizations are going through today. 
the smart ones are understanding it and taking baby steps you know you can't make radical change you got to find little little baby steps hit those milestones and continue on the path because the way we are going there's no way there's no turn back from there we are not going to turn back we are all heading in one direction and we know the direction is using technology managing disruption bringing our costs down improving efficiency uh, you know looking at sustainability goals of sustainability there's so much going on on equity right now whether it's uh, uh, you know women's rights uh, equal employment equal pay there's so many things that we're dealing with and all this transformation should become every company's short term goal because if you start putting these benchmarks and values to your senior management you'll start dealing with those issues so take things that are core to your beliefs and start putting those benchmarks for yourself and say look these are important to what i'm doing and start measuring those outwards and that's how you'll reach sustainability wow uh, i think that was a very very uh, detailed answer and as we know sustainability is going to be a key concept for businesses to adapt to uh, as you spoke on adaptability earlier when it came to kodak etc i think sustainability is also a concept which uh, if firms don't adapt to pretty fast they themselves will be the losers in the end so uh, thank you so much for describing that and going into the depths of sustainability with links to business um i know we're running a bit over so i'm just going to ask you the last two questions if you're okay absolutely uh, so sorry about this um i know we're busy and we've kept you here uh so dwan wants to know dwan but wants to know your thoughts on practical entrepreneurship i think you know everything about entrepreneurship is practical there's there's no solutions other than it being practical you know uh this is one breed of people that i have the utmost respect for uh is entrepreneurs because you know what it means to take knocks if you're a true entrepreneur uh you know if you're thinking on the right track you're putting the right values and you're actually going about it by putting everything as i said all in into your business you will achieve success over a longer period of your lifetime entrepreneurship is something that is very very close to my heart but this is not some you know i meet a lot of people in africa you know i've been dealing with a lot of mentorship sessions with entrepreneurs and they go sometimes are uh, all wrong you know they want the spoils of success a lot before they achieve success itself and success for them is you know if you raise 5 million dollars how do you put 4 million dollars into a nice house and a nice car that is not entrepreneurship you got to actually spend that money your time your resources your energies in actually building something which is long term and sustainable which is why i said you got to think you know we coined a word internally in all our businesses and we and it's not an original word of mine it also comes from a friend of mine who's an industrialist in india who talked about cathedral investing and cathedral investing is about building foundations so practical entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship in general is about building strong foundations when you're looking at doing something get the basics right in everything that you're doing if you're going into a new market understand the tax angles understand the market environment understand everything that you're doing there from a policy framework about the future transfer price there are thousands of things that we can talk about in business that impact our day to day lives and a lot of these things come to bite you in uh, after you've set up your businesses don't wait for retroactive actions on what you've set up you need to be proactive in making sure so whenever you're starting something spend an inordinate amount of time in actually studying and researching what you're getting into that's the practical part of doing things because once you get the foundations right you can make it into a modular structure and create you know the biggest or the smallest depending on what you're happy to do and therefore i think you know take entrepreneurship as something that is about a passion that you have to see success on about building a legacy and not about something that gives you a return on cash that is not the outcome of a of a true entrepreneur i don't know if i've answered the question but uh, you know i'd love to uh, hear back from the person who's asked the question if there's anything further that uh, she needs me to explain or he i think you've done more than more than answer the question uh, to say the least and uh, duan agrees with me last question before we close up 
Um, Tanvi asks, what is your definition of risk? And would you have any advice on how to weigh the risk, whether it is worth taking or not? <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, you know, I laugh because we often talk about this. In life there, you know, uh, when you read textbooks, they'll tell you about a thousand risks. I have two risks in life that I have broken my life down under. Risks that are man-made and risks that are not man-made. Risks that are man-made can never be mitigated. Now you can understand what this means. Corruption can never be mitigated. It's got to be managed. Anything that is man-made has to be managed. So remember that from a risk assessment point of view. You can never say that you'll ever be able to take these things out of your life because they'll always be there. It doesn't matter which part of the world you are in. You know, uh, you can let the uh, you know Western world or the developed world get on a high horse of integrity, but every country in the world is corrupt. There are corrupt people sitting everywhere, and I'm just taking one aspect of it. So that risk can never be mitigated. It has to be managed. Then you've got a lot of other risks that are not man-made. And those, are, unfortunately, you cannot mitigate, you know, a war in Ukraine. What do you do with that? You have a finite, and the consequences of that war, those risks have to then be dealt with as they impact your business. You've got to really manage risk slowly and steadily. And that's why I say that risk has to be managed. Mitigation is a strategy. You can say that you can minimize risk. There are risks of, you know, when you, there are certain risks that you have in your business that are things that are tangible. You know, you can have succession planning as a risk. You can have cash flow as a risk. There's, you know, eight, 10 other things that you can list out and say, these are risks that we see in our business. You can work towards a mitigation strategy there, but there are a lot of things in life. And these are the ones that you really got to watch are the ones you got to manage. And I think anyone sitting with gray hair in this call will know that 90% of risk has to be managed. It's not, uh, you cannot mitigate it. That's very true, uh, very true, uh, IG. And I think uh, with that, uh, we would end the Q&A session as well. I'm extremely sorry we took 20 minutes extra of your time, but would uh, really honored uh, that you have taken out the time to be here in spite of all your thousand commitments while you're managing Forbes, CNBC, all of these multinational companies. And still, you're so humble and stated roots that you're down to talk to our youngsters as part of Kodar Conversations. And I think we couldn't have had a better first speaker to start this launch. So very, very grateful to you uh, for taking out the time and uh, addressing the participants on this call. And also even more grateful for sharing so many anecdotes because I'm sure uh, someone or the other has been influenced by at least one of those anecdotes, if not more. And I personally, as someone who's recently started my entrepreneurship journey, found so many learnings from you, which we've seen already in the seven months. And that just proves uh, to us and to all the young uh, people here who are looking to be entrepreneurs that although entrepreneurship is a very risk-taking all-in journey, I think it's a very positive journey. And there are uh, there's a lot you can accomplish if you have your faith in it and if you have your heart in it. So thank you so, so much for inspiring us all today, uh, for taking out the time and for us, uh, apologies for over exceeding. And uh, thank you to everyone who tuned in as well. Uh, we look forward to having you all for the second Podar Conversations um, initiative, which will happen in April. And uh, yes, um, anyone else wants to add anything before we conclude, please feel free to. Thank you so much, Vidya. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much.